In today's okay. video, we'll learn about how author David Badrinas worked to overcome the imposter syndrome and how he has been able to be creative and to share his ideas. David is well on his way to publishing book two of the Caretaker series, and we will discuss how he approaches writing and where he gets confidence to write and uh, to share his writing with the world. So first of all, David, it's really nice to uh, have you on here. And uh, I would like uh, if you could start out by first just introducing yourself a little bit to my viewers. Sure. Um, thank you. And uh, I'm just I'm happy to have this conversation and to be hanging out with you. And uh, my name is David and um, I've, I do a lot of different things. And so uh, a little over three years ago, I started my YouTube channel. Um, mostly talking about some INFJ type stuff because it's psychology fascinates me and uh, and also dovetailing that with writing because I enjoy writing and it's something that I've always um, wanted to do and had my sights set on and um, <clears throat> you know I, I finally uh, after starting many different writing projects and not being able to follow them through um, and just kind of losing steam and all of that kind of stuff uh, I was finally able to buckle down enough to to get it done. And uh, the book has had some good success. And like you said, I'm writing, you know, I'm, I'm in the middle of writing the second one right now and the words are starting to flow again after it felt like the, the faucet was turned off, um, you know, just creatively. So, uh, so yeah, I, I've done lots of different things. My, my day job is more technical. I work with like databases. So I do a very, um, it's it's very logical uh, everything that I have to do on a day in and day out basis, uh, but I've also I've been a martial artist for for years. I ran my own karate school for many years, so um, I've always been doing something and in in a lot of ways, um, typically something that I that I end up having to measure against myself, uh, which I think is part of the reason why imposter syndrome in particular is a topic that I really enjoy uh, just kind of exploring. Yeah, I can tell you that the one reason why I invited you was because I wrestled very much with imposter syndrome myself, and only mm -hmm. this year did I realize to what extent I can struggle with those kind of thoughts, and uh, yep, uh, sure. yeah, how uh, important it's been for me to work through those kind of things. And before we get into that discussion, I know that you start out many of your videos in the same way by introducing yourself as an alien. Why do you call yourself <laughs> an alien? Um, so yeah, I, I usually for my the community that I have going, uh, it just kind of started out. Um, it was actually one of the videos that I mentioned it on really early on when I was when I was putting some shorter ones together and just kind of getting the channel going and. I just, I'm like, you know, I feel like an alien. Like, I feel like somebody who's often misunderstood. Um, I have had people from different jobs that I've had who have just been really honest and said, listen, you're just an enigma. Like, I don't, I don't get you. And, uh, right. you know, and you know what you're doing and you're talented at it, but like, I just don't understand uh, mm -hmm. why you are the way you are. And, you know, I, it's the kind of thing where it's like, I, I just sort of want to take that term and run with it. And be like, you know what, fine. Like, I, I do feel in a lot of ways out of place in normal society and in, especially in social situations. And so I embrace it. I'm like, look, okay, I, I guess I'm just weird. And, uh, yeah. you know, this is who I am. And, and I'm like, and I'm all right with it. Like, it's cool. Like, there's a bunch of us around. There's aliens walking everywhere right now, you know, and, and we're the misunderstood people. We're the ones that are, that tend to be, um, just you know they're, they're just that way i guess and i've when i look back at, with a, with a very honest eye to my friendships and relationships in my history that's something that just really has been a, a a theme you know and much of it is because i haven't had the tools to really understand things about myself and so i've made a, a real concerted effort to try and understand myself better forgive myself for some of those failings in the way that I am and mm. try to get a real understanding of why I react the way I do to certain things and why I feel a little bit out of place and just sort of on the on the periphery of uh, mm. of especially the social world yeah because I just love how you kind of reclaim your own identity and the label for yourself in a sense for so sure 
one uh, thing that uh, struck me was growing up, uh, I was also often referred to as an alien and people would say you're yep. in the twilight zone and uh, they yep. would uh, uh, call me E.T. because my initials <laughs> Eric Thor. So when the movie came out, everyone was like, oh, there's the alien. <laughs> there's <an> E.T. <laughs> there's the alien. Oh, no. <laughs> right. So, I, did you did you find that it was something that was like... Um, did you understand why people saw you in that way? Because that's something that's really interesting to me. Like, you kind of get it. Like, all right, like, I, I guess this is just how I am. Yeah, that's it. Uh, I tend to fall into the self-deprecatory swamp in a sense. So it's very easy right. for me to just turn it into a sense of humor and lightness. And <laughs> yeah. Be like, whatever, <laughs> you know, call me what you want, you right. know? So, right, yeah. right. So um, one thing I was curious about is, um, uh, I think uh, people can have a loose idea of what imposter syndrome is, but what would you say the opposite to having imposter syndrome would be like in your own words? Like, uh, imagine a person who had the <laughs> opposite of it. What would that be like? To to me, that's that's kind of like unearned confidence. You know, uh, it's that sort of like hold my beer, I can do anything, regardless of whether I've had any exposure or experience in it or not. Um, you know, it's, it's that it's the opposite thing with when you have, when you suffer from that imposter syndrome feeling, it's that sort of thing that really brings you down and holds yourself back. So I'd say the opposite is that person that's just, I can do absolutely anything and I'm going to be great at anything. And normally they're not, um, you know, so it's, it is like grand overconfidence, I think would probably be the best opposite that I could label for imposter syndrome. So why do I get a picture of Donald Trump in my head when I hear this? Uh, <laughs> I mean, there are plenty of there are plenty of narcissists out there and people that have that overconfidence out there that that really do feel like, you know, no matter what. And in some cases you have people that are just extremely talented. They know that they're talented at one given thing and are great at it, understand that about themselves and embrace it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, one of my favorite things to watch is tennis, right? And Wimbledon is going right now and it's just very near and dear to me. I, I grew up watching it like all the time. And you have these guys that are like, you know, Novak Djokovic, who's just his champion multiple times over. And he struggled, he had a match today to get into the quarterfinals and he was, he was losing, he was down by two sets. And he has a champion's mentality. And I think there's a difference between having a champion's mentality and being confident in yourself and your abilities because you've done it and you've demonstrated it and you're just confident that way than somebody who hasn't done it, who's just I can, I'm just gonna be the best at this, you know? So right. there, there's, there's a real difference in that. So which personality types would you say tend to have the most struggles with imposter syndrome? For me, it's it it tends to be those the the NF types. I really think like that that intuition and and combined with with a strong feeling, typically extroverted feeling. But I, you know, I don't dive too much into the cognitive functions to be honest to to really try and pinpoint it because we are all very different. And so you know, the way I always describe the functions and and your type to people is I say, listen, these are your type is are the, the gears that are making everything work. But your personality is, is what makes you uniquely you. And so if you grew up in an environment where you were made to feel in some ways that you weren't good at things, uh, that you were made to feel in some ways that you were a burden of some kind, mm -hmm. or you were knocked down, you didn't receive um, you know, a, lot of that, a lot of that support, and a, a lot of times left on, on your own to deal with that. I think that has more of a hand. I think it's less on, per, less on cognitive type and more on your personality and your history and, and how you were nurtured coming through that brings this upon you. Um, but I, I definitely do feel like it's a little bit more of a feeler thing than a thinker thing. Mm. Is that perhaps because uh, the things that we tend to deal with and be primarily interested in are things that are more subjective in their nature? I mean, a tennis player, like you mentioned, like they know if they're doing good or bad because they know if right. they win or lose. And uh, Correct. Uh, 
and uh, a writer perhaps doesn't necessarily know because what how do we define and measure what constitutes being a talented or successful artist or how do we grade well, very these true. kind of things that's very true it's it's not you know something like writing or art or something creative um or anything along those lines you know or even in a professional standpoint you know doctors experience imposter syndrome um you know a lawyers experience imposter syndrome this is something that's really around yeah. and and i think it tends to happen when you place yourself among a group in a competitive way but it's impossible to measure that competitiveness you mm -hmm. know you can say for instance the tennis match right there's a court there's two people you win the point or you don't and right. and that's really it um when you're talking about something in a professional atmosphere you're or creative you're having to put your creative work your your mind out there and nobody's path is the same it's very difficult to to measure yourself against another person um mm -hmm. you know i encountered this all the time when i ran a martial arts school because you know you rank up you get a new belt you know so on and so forth when you test and everything else but everybody's journey is so very different and I, I have had many students who came up to me that said, like, I don't feel like I've earned this. I don't feel like I'm that good. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's it always took some explaining to be like, listen, you're you are competing against yourself and yourself only. Right. Nobody else is in this. And so when when if I award you a test and then you test for it and you get your new belt, that's because I'm I'm looking at you as an individual and looking at your growth. And you have done that. So you have earned this. Mm. Just you may not be have the same skill level as the person next to you. You know, you may not if I can't compare like somebody's kick to the exact same kind of kick that somebody else does. Obviously, there's a right and wrong way, but our body shapes are different, our flexibility is different, um, mm. all of those different things. So, you know, what I always said was like, look, you you have to measure your effort. And as long as you're willing to put all that effort in. And, and do it that way, you're going to grow. And that's the only person that you really should be competing against. Uh, right, right. So for yourself then, like how do you grade yourself? And how do you grade, for example, the success of your book or like your YouTube channel? Like what is it that makes you feel like I've done something good here with this video or this book? Right, well, when I started out, um, you know, I, I didn't have a book. I didn't have any, like I had, I had nothing. So um, it's pretty easy. Like I, I just set, I, I basically just set a bar for myself of just finish it, just complete it. Mm -hmm. And, and don't worry about anything else. I'm not trying to be the next Stephen King or JK Rowling or anything else. I'm not trying to compare myself to anybody else. And I fell into that trap numerous times, you know, mm -hmm. with friends that I have that are authors and published authors. And I, I, you know, I tried to absorb a bit of the way they did it, but it, I had to come to an understanding that their path is not my path and that I have a different path where I need to grow and be better at everything else. So for me, my, my measurement for success was to write a book and have one person I've never met purchase the book. That's it. And I'm like, if, if, as long as I do that, I'm going to be happy and, mm -hmm. and I'm going to be okay. I don't need any more. Um, you know, I'm not under any kind of a grand illusion that I'm going to be the next bestseller all over the place and that I'm going to have movies and, and everything else. Um, that's not what it was about. So it was really just about measuring it against myself. And I have put myself in situations throughout my, my career, my professional life, my personal life to try and hit some marks where I'm just competing against myself. One of the things that I did uh, that was a lot of fun and I did it for a few years was Spartan races. These are big obstacle races where you've got to run like 13 miles and there's 30 obstacles. And if you don't make the obstacle, you have to do burpees, which is terrible. Um, you know, and in those, it forces you, you know, the only thing I wanted to do was get to the finish line. I'm not the fittest. I'm not fast, the fastest. I'm not any of those things, but I can get to the end. And I kept pushing myself to do that. And so every race that I did, I didn't care about my time. I cared about crossing the finish line and finishing it. And I, the way I saw it was as long as I focused my effort on getting to that end and not worrying about somebody passing me or not being as skilled at something, 
but I'm going to finish. And a really interesting thing happened in that when I did some of those races and I, I was seven miles into one of them, it was one of the last races that I had done that was 13 miles long and it was up a ski mountain. I mean, it is not an easy race. It takes hours and hours and hours for, for somebody in my condition to do it. And um, I had to climb a rope and I was climbing this rope to hit a bell. It was about 20 feet up in the air. And my hand slipped when I was up there and I broke my finger uh, suspended 20 feet up in the air. I hit the bell, I come back down and I'm like, wow, this really hurts. And I went into some water. We had to swim for a little bit and then come out and do another obstacle. And I felt my fingers swelling up and it was getting hot and everything else. And I'm like, oh crap. Like I have to get to a medical tent. I have to get them to wrap it up. And I was in that tent and it was cold out. It was fall. It's in Vermont, which is just, it was just a cold ski mountain in Killington. And they wrap up my finger and she's like, do you need to sit for a few minutes? And I was looking around and there are people in there that for one reason or another weren't finishing the race and they had blankets and hot cocoa. And I'm like, oh man, this looks really good because I've just been busting my butt for seven miles and I got a broken finger. I had every excuse to just stop. Hmm. But I'm like, no, I have to get to the end. No matter what, I have to get to the end. And I, I kept going. And so I'm here with my wrapped hand and I'm on one of these obstacles. And there was a guy up there who looked incredibly fit and he was an athlete. And he's like, I'm leaving, I'm quitting this race. He's like, this is just, I can't, like, I can't do this anymore. Mm. And in my head, I'm saying, you know what, that's, there is a mentality thing. You have all the tools that he had all the tools and he had the, the physique and everything to finish this race. He had no problem to do it, but he just, he wasn't going to get there. And I'm not sure what he was measuring himself up against, but for me, it was just get to the finish line. So I applied the same thing to the book, just write the words and get to the end of it and then deal with whatever's next when that happens. But the only thing that I could control was carving out some time, putting words down and trying to get the count up to finish the story and then sell one copy, which I sold, I sold a few, so I'm okay. <laughs> That's great to hear. So what do you think what it was that uh, gave you the, the desire to finish things? Like what, where, where do you think that drive comes from in a sense? If you said that many people just gave up, like in a sense, like why do you think that uh, you uh, decided to stick true with it? So for me personally, um, I have had so many starts and stops on projects. I, I wanted to start a YouTube channel for a year before I uploaded a video. I just couldn't bring myself to do it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I wanted to write books and I've started and stopped numerous stories and just never got there. Um, you know, this particular one, The Caretaker, when I started it, I was 30,000 words into a completely different story. Yeah. And this one just kind of took over. But what had happened for me was just a, a shift in my perspective. And that shift came when my brother passed away. So this is just over three years ago now. And uh, this is my big brother, he was 10 years older than me. And he, he died suddenly. It was just like a, a freak thing on an operating table, was supposed to have surgery, 15 minutes on his shoulder. And his heart gave out coming out of anesthesia. And it, it just completely upended every single part of my life. Like it changed everything. And I thought to myself, no, it, it wasn't for him. But it was a realization that anything around me, myself included, can just be gone tomorrow. Nobody was expecting it. He was completely healthy. Like everything was fine. I was on the phone with him, you know, shortly before he went in to, to have his shoulder worked on. And, and then just one day, it's just different. And I thought, you know, what am I doing here? Worrying about what people will think. Worrying about, you know having the time to do something, uh, worrying about all of those different external things. And that really pushed me to say, you know what, I'm, I'm just going to, I'm just going to finish it. Like what, like if I, if I could be gone tomorrow, I should just accomplish this today. And so I just kind of kept that mindset and, you know, I mean, maybe it's a little morbid, like, you know, anything or anybody like it's, it's a heavy topic for sure. Yeah but it's not wrong. Everything is impermanent. We're not here for very long. Um, you know, and, and 
120 years from now, the entire population of the earth is going to be completely different than it is today. Yeah. And that's not a long time, you know? And so why, why hold myself back and torture myself over what if somebody doesn't like something I write? Why not just write it and focus on the people that would? Um, you know, so I always try to do things with, with that in mind. I always try to write something that in some way will, somebody will read and resonate with and that might help them. Um, I do the same thing for my YouTube videos. I just really like helping people and giving them a little bit of a boost. And so I, I just changed my mindset. I mean, it was kind of like a forced way. And I thought I, I have to stop worrying so much about all of these things that are completely outside of my control. Um, you think, think stoicism, right? Where it's, you, you, you make that difference between the things you can and you cannot control. And if you can't control it, yeah. get rid of it. You know, I, 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 the only thing I can do right now is put words down. And so mm. that's what I have to do. I uh, can uh, definitely resonate with uh, some of the things that you touch on here and uh, allow me to give a theory here based on what you said and you can always uh, like share your perspective on how you think about it but uh, sure. it almost sounds like uh, uh, up until that happened you hadn't really been confronted with your own mortality in a sense and it sounds like yep. this uh, experience for you made you realize that you have a limited time on this planet in a sense and after knowing that uh, you couldn't make excuses anymore because before that, in a sense, you could just make excuses because you could always prepare and plan and think sure. ahead and keep going. But at some point you recognize that uh, there is a limit to how long I can spend on a decision or waiting or procrastinating something. Right. Um, I have to start getting something done. No, that's not, that's, that's not a, that's not an incorrect assessment at all. Um, you know, and, and I, I think in a lot of ways, it's that sort of thing, like when you're, when you're much younger, you're a teenager or whatever else, you just kind of feel indestructible. I can do all the stupid things. I can set stuff on fire. I can be an idiot. Like I can do all that kind of, you know, ridiculous stuff that teenagers might do. And, and, and it's whatever, you don't feel, you don't feel that um, mm. when it's somebody that's really close to you and that kind of perspective that you just see it right up front and there's no denying it that does tend to change things a little bit. And this is something that I really had my heart set on accomplishing and I've always wanted to accomplish. And so it was, it was just a matter of, okay. And, and it's difficult. Writing is really hard in that way because we, we also live in a very instant gratification kind of society. Well, you can't write a book in a day, at least not have it be any, be, be a, a real quality you know, a hundred thousand words, that's impossible. Like, you know, that's really, really difficult to do that in, in an instant gratification kind of way. So, so it took some diligence, like every Saturday morning, I'd go to the coffee shop, I'd put down a thousand or 2000 words until I had 85,000 words. And then I was like, all right, like I got, and, and I knew the story. I knew what I wanted to tell. Um, the book was not difficult for me to write because I write my main character as an INFJ in a lot of ways and so for me it's just a natural like that was a more natural thing it's all the other stuff that was you know the stuff that is out of your control I have to send it to an editor I have to get a cover done like you know all of these different things that I, I wasn't doing on my own um, you know that, that that you just navigate through step by step anyway so, uh, and then not worrying, like I, I had, I'm not sitting here trying to compete with Stephen King or whoever else I'm trying to write my work and put my story together and the people that read it and are like, this is really, this is really great. And, you know, I loved it and I love the character and I love the story. And it, I feel like I, I feel like I know this character because he's a lot like the way I am. That to me was everything you know, and that, that's what made the biggest difference for me. And that's why I wanted to keep it going. So, because you also were touching on that just now, I'm curious if you could tell us a little bit about your book. Uh, what's it about? Sure. What's the story behind it? Yep. Um, so it, it very much is a, so it's supernatural fiction. And, um, you know, for me, it was definitely uh, a way to cope with the loss of my brother. And even though it's in a, it's in a fan fantasy kind of world, 
or a supernatural kind of world, there are themes of death and loss. And that was something that I was very heavy in experiencing at the time. I was about 5,000 words into the book when my brother passed away. And our last phone conversation, I was telling him about it. And he said, I want to hear all about it. But like, I have to go to an appointment. And he's like, why don't you just get back to me when you're back from vacation? Because I was going on vacation to Las Vegas. I was actually in Las Vegas when I got the word that he had passed away. Hmm. And so, um, you know, that that kind of pushed me to hit some of those themes in the book. So uh, the protagonist's name is William and William in the book is um, he's long lived. I'm not going to say quite like immortal, but he he and death have a have a relation, a working relationship, essentially. And he mm -hmm. is a caretaker for death. Death is an entity uh, in the book and in the story. Psychological concepts like abstract concepts can be human or can be an object or whatever else. So if you ever thought, what would it be like to sit down with somebody that was the absolute embodiment of love or of death? That's what William does in the book. And so there's there's kind of a, um, a, a theme of all of these concepts influencing the world and influencing us. And my hope is that when people read it, they start to think about the people that influence them in these certain ways. And um, I've seen a lot of that in the different reviews and things that people have said. So hmm. it's essentially a story about him finding his way and finding out why he is where he is in, in his life and doing this job for, for death. And um, he's a little over a century old when the book starts and he's very um, disconnected from everything because this is something else that I was just kind of toying with in my head was, you know, just this idea of if you were if you could live for as long as you as long as you wanted to live, what would your personal relationships look like? You would be stuck in a certain age and you'd have all this experience, this life experience, but everybody that you meet, you may meet as a child, you're going to grow up and you're going to see them get old and die. And what would that do to a person? And what would it do to your personal relationships? And so he's a very... Um, he starts out just kind of cranky that way, you know, because everything is impermanent and it's him struggling with that impermanence and then eventually yeah. finding some of these reasons to carry on the way he does. So, um, so yeah, I mean, there's plenty of reviews of the book on Amazon. It's uh, there's almost 150 reviews up there now. It's a five star book. Wow. So like, um, I, I've got good stuff. If anybody's interested, they can just go and certainly just read a couple of the reviews. People, I try not to give away too much about it, but but people, you know, they, they definitely have their their certain things that they like. So, I can tell you, I'm definitely hooked myself. Uh, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a big reader. Um, I yep. love science fiction, fantasy, and uh, yep. these thematics are super fascinating to me. One thing that also got me was from the Goodreads description. Uh, what it, it explores the nature of what it is to be human navigating death loss love loss and our own psychology to discover how we fit in our own harsh reality we all make mistakes bad decisions and deal with insecurities uh, William is flawed and finding his own way through a high stakes world much like right. our own yep. so the thing that got me there was uh, you're touching on uh, uh, the feeling of being flawed or of um, having imperfections, which is certainly a team Absolutely. that I can see that many INFJs seem to struggle with. Uh, right. I noticed that many INFJs uh, are extremely idealistic about who they want <laughs> to be for the world and for yeah, other people. Yeah, that's, that's a pretty common theme for sure. <laughs> uh, so um, at the same time, I'm learning more and more that um, as an INFJ, you have to be human in order to connect with people. Um, yes. So I'm wondering, what uh, are your own uh, experiences with uh, your own mistakes and uh, insecurities? Ooh. And how do you, uh, how are you able to be vulnerable with other people about those aspects of yourself? Okay, so that's a that's a really good question. Um, I can't tell you how many times I sat here after filming a video thinking, should I post that? You know, and, and should really, should I show, should I show that? Uh, on my channel, there are videos where I am very upset, where I am, where I am crying, where I'm having a bad day, I'm not handling the loss of my brother well. 
uh, I'm very open about those things. And what I found happened was that I, I was worried about showing that to other people. Mm -hmm. But as soon as I did, I started getting more messages, comments, emails, private emails, people sending me emails saying, please don't say anything about this. Like, don't like post it anywhere or anything like that. But like, I want to tell you a little bit about my story. Mm -hmm. uh, I started hearing from people saying that when they saw my video and me having a breakdown over one thing or another, that it was the first time that they had felt seen. Mm -hmm. And that realization that in order to, in, we're humans, right? And we can connect on a superficial level in any way, you know, if you like a, a specific sport or a specific food, and I like that sport or food, we can have a conversation about that sport or food. And it's a superficial surface level conversation. Fine. But all of us experience loss. We all experience um, heartache. We all go through those things. And mm -hmm. But that's the stuff that's a little bit more difficult to open up and talk about because you're very guarded. You've got your own walls and you know that other people have theirs. So I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to put this out there. And I started getting just a lot of these messages from people that were like, it's just, this is the first time somebody expressed the way I was feeling and I got to see it. And thank you for being so vulnerable because now I feel like, like I'm really connecting to somebody. And so, so to be open and show people that you struggle, but also that that's not all you are and that you, there is some positivity that can come out of these different things. I find that to be really, really important. And the more I, I did that, obviously not showing everybody every little aspect of your life, but showing some of those more difficult moments really helps people to feel connected and part of a community. Now we're feeling like we're, we're alien friends. You know, in a way, you know, because we're, we're sharing something that's on a much deeper level than, okay, I like chocolate too, which is important, right? Yeah. But, but it's, it's, it's different. And, you know, I just found that when I started opening up about those things, that it, it made it, it made people able to relate to me much easier. I'm able to relate to other people in a much easier way, because now we've just connected on something very, very different. And I've had, I've had, uh, you know, people that have been on my channel that have been subscribers for, for the full time that I've been on there, you know, nearly three years of my first subscribers that still write and comment and connect and say, thank you, you know, because you showed this and you showed that it's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to be a sensitive person in a lot of ways, um, that not everything has to be this show. Um, yeah. you know, that there's, there's some, there's some ugliness, you know, around that life is hard. Uh, you know, it's, it, there's, and, and this promotion and, and the way we conduct ourselves online and just the way the online social media world is, you know, it's something that you have to remember when you look at Instagram and you see somebody's amazing picture, well, they probably took 200 pictures to pick out the absolute best one with the absolute best lighting and angle and everything else. And so when you're looking at that, that's, it's very hard to relate to something like that. When you see somebody that's posting and is just being really honest and showing an ugly moment, um, that's, that's much easier to relate to because like, okay, finally, like, this is what I'm, this is, this is what I'm going through as well. Yeah. That's something I can feel very strongly as a highly sensitive person as well, because uh, the truth is I'm hit by emotions tend all the time. Like people tend to see me as a very logical, uh, uh, detached person in a sense. And I try so hard to be positive for other people uh, and I do too. give yeah, yeah. good energy for others. Uh, but still, you know, I see a stranger who looks a bit sad on the streets and I feel there like that. Uh, or, yeah, I heard this weekend about the passing of uh, YouTuber uh, Technoblade right. and yep. uh, that just got me like thinking about you know what would it be like if I could never go live again or could never uh, post anything right. again like that's uh, like uh, there are so many like moments where you're like yeah as a human you are caught up in emotions and you're caught up in uh, things that just uh, yeah are just difficult to deal with so having people that you can relate to and connect with I think that also helps you kind of get over some shame that you might feel because I oh 100 percent I was thinking back to your story about 
the that race where people were giving up uh, and I was thinking about what would make a person want to give up and one thing that I think makes people give up is shame and that is that feeling that oh I'm a uh, I'm a quitter I'm lazy I'm I'm not good enough I'm not uh, right uh, you know like those negative feed feelings and th- that shame uh, causes people to quit causes people to For struggle sure. to finish things because they har- have that idea of themselves that the image of themselves as uh, bad people or they have problems in their life that they are not able to really open up about or express to the world in a sense well and and to dig just a just a little deeper on that is is that there there is a very there's very much so a fear of failure going on Mm -hmm. and i think when you're afraid to fail and to be like look i tried this and it didn't work um you know and, and you tend to hold yourself back and you're your head is going through all sorts of things. Your mind is going through all sorts of things when that fear starts to happen because you don't want to admit that you're afraid because admitting that you're afraid is a vulnerable thing. You, so you prevent yourself from, from trying and doing and understanding that you're going to make mistakes and understanding that that's part of the process and that's part of the learning process. That's really, really important. Um, that fear tends to just, really hold us back for a lot of things. And for me, it's, it, you know, I mean, I, I struggled with this as recently as just a couple months ago with one of the videos that I posted. You know, I was looking to have a good morning. I went out, I, I was ready to write. I was like, you know, there was nothing wrong with my morning or my day. But as soon as I sat down in the coffee shop and I started to put some words down, I don't know what the, the trigger was. It may have been a song that had come on or, or something along those lines, I really don't remember but my brother was very heavy on my mind and I felt myself getting upset in, in the coffee shop. And then I came back and I came back here and I, I wrote a letter. I I just wrote some thoughts to him and I recorded it. And at the end of it, I just absolutely lost it. Like I went into just kind of like a rage mode. I smashed the keyboard and I just started sobbing. And, you know, I, I sat on that video for, for quite a few hours thinking like, I don't know, like, I I don't, I don't know. I'm afraid to share this, you know, because this was just a very vulnerable personal moment for me. But then that's that thought that I had. I'm like, okay, look, like there are other people experiencing this and they are afraid too. They're afraid to show themselves. They're afraid to cry. Some of them don't even want to show that face to the people that they're in the same room because they're afraid of being judged or they're afraid of how it's going to come off or they're afraid of being called sensitive or whatever else. And so I'm like, you know what? I, I have, like, I, I don't have anything to lose here. So let me post it and be like, look, I, here you go. Like, this is what it looks like when you're healing really. And when you're having this kind of a breakdown and, and that's the kind of feedback that I had received was like, you know, I, I'm like, that's a really vulnerable moment thank you for sharing it because I experienced that and I, I'm, I'm afraid of it, you know? And so I think getting, getting past a lot of that fear that comes, fear and shame are like hand in hand uh, in this kind of thing. And yeah. so I, I think getting past that is just really important understanding that it's okay. Like it's okay to fail. It's okay to crash at something. For me, it was always like, I don't, I don't care if I bleed or sweat or cry I'm going to get to the finish line of that race. Mm. And I applied the same thing to the book. I don't care if I'm bleeding or sweating or crying. I'm going to get to, to the words of the end at the end of it. And, and then I've accomplished it and I'm going to be happy, you know, and that's okay. And then try and share that journey with other people. Writers are so insecure. We, we had just authors and writers there's so much of that imposter syndrome going around because yeah. it's so easy to compare yourself to other people. They're out there. They've got bestsellers. They write. I, I met somebody just a couple of weeks ago that had written, it was something like 25 books in, in the span of like four or five years. And I'm like, it took me two years to get one now. Like, I don't know how. And, and it's, if I compared myself to that person's output, I would never want to write again because like, I can't, like, I can't be doing that. He said he wakes up, he gets, he sits down with coffee at nine in the morning and he's done writing at midnight and he does it for 40 straight days 
and yeah. he cranks out a book. And I'm like, look, but again, it's that understanding and that experience of being able to say, well, that's not my path. I'm not 67 years old and retired. I don't, I don't have like, you know, I've got kids, I've got my, my day job and everything else. That's not my path. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to try and find success the way I can and just not compare myself to this guy. It was fascinating listening to him for sure. Yeah. Um, but, but I can't let, let his output and his path make me afraid to walk on mine. No. And, and so that's what I was determined not to do. I find you honestly so inspiring to listen to and I also think <laughs> that uh, many people can probably uh, probably feel the same way that uh, they'd also want to become more open uh, and maybe start posting on YouTube or maybe for write sure. something or publish something. So uh, what advice would you have for people that are uh, going through that and uh, to handle the doubts that they might have around that? I mean, my, my advice is, is to just take that next step, right? And to not look too far ahead, but to just take the next step. If you want to write something, write something. I tell this to people all the time because people tell me I want to be a writer. And I'll ask them, well, did you write anything? And they say, well, yeah. And I'm like, well, then you are a writer. You're, just, you're working on your craft. Like that's how yeah. it's supposed to go. You know, there's nothing wrong with it. And you are, and if you keep doing that, you are going to produce something beautiful. And if you share it, you are going to resonate with somebody that needs to hear exactly what that voice in your head wanted to say in that moment and so i i say share and don't be don't be fake or anything like that you don't have to put on a facade for anybody just be vulnerable be yourself get out there some people will not like you that's normal um you know nobody likes everybody and we can't force them to like us and you shouldn't anyway that's not where your effort and energy should go um mm -hmm. I mean, I get plenty of trolls on my page. It happens all the time. You know, there's always somebody that's going to come up that says, you're not an INFJ. Those people are everywhere, you know? But it's like, look, I ultimately, and this is what I tell myself, yeah. is uh, you, I have maybe 200 hours of content on YouTube or wherever else. I've been alive. I just had my 47th birthday in May. You have seen 200 hours of my life. You have no idea what I am. Like no idea. And, and so, you know, it, it certainly somebody that digs into your, you know, a psychiatrist or a psychologist will know me for sure, because like, they're getting to see all of the, all of this stuff and the way I've made decisions and all those relationships that I talked about earlier, when I look back and like, this is what it was like as a kid, and, ay, 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 um, all those different things. So I'd say there's really, there's nothing holding you back from anything. And honestly, like, most people you'll post something and, and people just won't care. But the ones that do and that find you, th that connection is so precious. And, and I've, I've met and talked with people. Um, I mean, shoot, I have somebody that I, I've talked back and forth with on YouTube who's in Kenya. And, you know, I, I've never met this person. I'm most likely never going to meet this person. But every time he comments, his name's James. And I, I just like, it fills my heart when I see him comment because he was somebody that really struggled and with who he was and people made fun of him for being very sensitive and a very, you know, for lack of a better term, just a very masculine society. And, you know, and he sees me doing the things that I'm doing and it's inspiring him. And he's like, now I understand myself a little bit better and I can handle myself better. And, you know, every time he writes, he says, thank you. And so to those people that are just thinking about it, I, it's the world absolutely, especially right now, just needs to hear your voice. Yeah. You know, you have something important to say and important to share. It will resonate with somebody. Just get out there and, and don't have this idea of I'm going to be this big thing. Please don't think that you're going to get on YouTube and make a million dollars because you won't. Right. So, but with that three dollar CPM, no, <laughs> no <way. laughs> yeah. But, but you will do you will do things for people by being authentic and honest that that are priceless for them, and that's really that's what keeps me going to to keep wanting to do the things that I do. Thank you so much for sharing everything, uh, and I will say to my viewers. Uh, 
Uh, don't forget to check out David's channel. I will link it down below as well as a link to uh, his Amazon, to his book, uh, The Caretaker. Yeah, for sure. And uh, yeah, once again, uh, really appreciate uh, having you here on the show. Absolutely. I'm, I'm not hard to track down. People can find me on Instagram. Send me a message and say hi. If you've read the book, let me know. You know, I love talking to people about stuff like this. And so I really appreciate it. I'm so glad you sent an email to me and that we're able to connect and just have a nice conversation. This stuff is great.